Okay, so we cut away from the Capulet household. We're now back out in the street with Romeo and Benvolio, and now they've added one of the characters Shakespeare created for this play, who's not in the original poem about Romeo and Juliet, a guy named Mercutio, who is one of my favorite characters and one of the most beloved Shakespearean creations of all time. He gets all the best jokes, all the best humor, and he's just a ton of fun, even if he does talk a lot. The reason why I've had to split this video into two halves is primarily because of just the amount of time Mercutio spends talking. But he's got a lot of really cool things to say, so don't just tune out on Mercutio, otherwise you're going to miss some of the most important stuff going on in this play. Now, when this scene begins, we've got Romeo Mercutio with five or six maskers because the party that they're going to is a masquerade ball. That's part of how they're going to be able to get into the Capulet party, even though they're Montagues. They're all going to be wearing masks, and thus they will have a hidden identity. All right, there are torch bearers that lets us know that it's nighttime, and you've got other people who are coming along to either attend the party, if you remember, Mercutio was one of the people who was invited, or crash the party as Romeo and Benvolio intended to for their different reasons. So another thing that you need to keep in mind as we begin opening this scene is Romeo, Mercutio, Benvolio, and all their friends have been what in among college students, if I remember is correct, they have been what's called pre-gaming. Um, before a lot of young people like to go out and hit the clubs or hit the bars, a lot of times they will drink at home before they go out to lower their inhibitions and also save themselves money. In order to have the courage to crash the Capulet party, a lot of times it's played that these characters have been drinking fairly heavily beforehand. And that certainly makes a lot of the things that Mercutio has to say as the scene goes on make a lot more sense. In the 1996 version of, of Romeo and Juliet, which I'll put a link to in the description, they actually play the famous Queen Mab speech, which we're going to see today, given by Mercutio, as he and the people he's talking to are all taking ecstasy. And honestly, that speech kind of makes more sense if all the people who are involved with it are on drugs, because it's a pretty crazy speech. Uh, I won't spoil it too much beyond that, but that's what's going on here. Now, this is not in any way to endorse these sorts of behaviors. I don't think I need to say that, given that we know how these young people end up, which is with both Romeo and Juliet dead. But it's not beyond the scope of our imagination to understand how they're behaving. And once again, one of the things that I will point to is people don't change. It's been 500 years since this play was first put on. And to this day, people still pregame in order to make sure they have the courage to go out and talk to the person that they find attractive, to go out and be sociable, to deal with their anxieties. And it's something that a lot of my young students are going to have to confront and deal with in their, in their days. And you need to make up your mind. Are, are you going to be like Mercutio? I think he's a fun character, but as this play goes on, I think you'll see he's not exactly the type of character you should emulate in any way, shape, or form. But we'll talk more about that as the play goes on. So the scene begins in a street. They're talking about heading to the party. They have not gotten there yet. The pregame is in full effect, and that's where we'll begin with Romeo wondering how sh how are we going to make our entrance if you guys have ever seen any of the movies uh, where they show people going to an old party a lot of times they will have a servant announce a couple or a group of guests as they arrive so the the people show up at the party and then the, the servant will announce the honorable duke and duchess of sussex and then everybody will turn and nod and then they'll come on in now romeo and benvolio can't do that because if they are introduced as Romeo and Benvolio of the House Montague, everyone is going to try to kill them for crashing the party. So Romeo asks the question, what, shall this speech be spoke for our excuse or shall we on without an apology? Saying like, are we going to be introduced or are we just going to show up? Benvolio's response to Romeo's question is, the date is out of such prolixity. We'll have no Cupid hoodwinked with a scarf, bearing a Tartar's painted bow of lath, scaring the ladies like a crow keeper. No, with, no, nor no without book or prologue faintly spoke after the prompter for our entrance. But let them measure us by what they will. We'll measure them a measure and be gone. 
And Benvolio's response to Romeo asking, are we going to be introduced formally or are we just going to jump into the party is, it's not fashionable anymore to be introduced. All right, we're not going to have somebody introduce us formally and scare off the ladies. Instead, we're just going to get in there and jump into the party. And once we get there, and the key, there's a, a, a pun, a double entendre, if you will, going on in those last couple of words with the repetition of the word measure. When he says, but let them measure us by what they will. Now, in that sense, he's talking about the way you might measure someone with a ruler, or if you're taking the measure of a man, you're, you're finding out like what they're about, what they are on the inside, who they truly are. So let them judge us the way they want to judge us when we get there. We'll measure them a measure and be gone. Now, the other meaning for the word measure denotatively is like one, to know the length of something, or two, the length of space in a piece of music, the number of beats in a given set of time. And so we'll measure them a measure, we'll dance them a dance and be gone. All right, so the party they're going to will have dancing. Maybe he's saying, we'll just dance them a dance. On the other hand, if you guys have ever seen like two dudes in a hallway shoving each other, one saying like, you want to dance, bro? Like they're not talking about getting down and boogie and they're talking about fighting. And so Benvolio is allowing for that possibility as well. We're going to go. We're either going to dance one way or we're going to dance another way. Whatever we go, whatever we do is whatever we do. All right. Now, Romeo is hesitant, all right? He's still hung up on Rosaline. He is not convinced he's going to have a good time because the only girl he wants to talk to doesn't want to talk to him. He doesn't want to look at the other girls that Benvolio is going to try to show him. So Romeo's response to that is, give me a torch. I'm not for this ambling. Being but heavy, I will bear the light. And, and so Romeo is also playing with sound and playing with words uh, in terms of what they can mean. He doesn't want to dance. He's like, I'm, I'm not going to dance. I'll just hold on to this torch and pretend like I'm a servant and you guys have your fun. Now, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. Now, one, like there's a phrase that's fallen out of usage in popular times, but it was more prevalent in, in decades gone by, where if you carry a torch for someone, it means that you have a crush on them that either they don't know about or they do not reciprocate. And so Romeo, when he says, I'll carry the torch, that actually comes into like English usage for centuries later if you carry a torch for someone that means that you're pining for them you're wanting them but your love is not requited your love is not returned being but heavy I will bear the light Romeo saying my feet are too heavy to dance I will supply the light from this torch rather than the light dancing of my feet but Mercutio when he hears this jumps into the conversation. Nay, gentle Romeo, we must have you dance. Because the purpose of this is to cheer Romeo up. And Mercutio and Benvolio are now trying to reach the same objective. We have to get Romeo out of this depression. But if Romeo goes to a party and like stands in a corner holding a torch and doesn't talk to anybody, it's just going to bum him out more. It's just going to make him more depressed. So if Romeo is going to have fun, if he's going to circulate and talk to girls, he needs to get out on the dance floor. It's just that simple. And so Mercutio is also encouraging Romeo to get out there. But Romeo says, not I. Believe me, you have dancing shoes with nimble soles. I have a soul of lead. So stakes me to the ground, I cannot move. So Romeo says, nah, my soul is too heavy. It feels like lead. And so it nails my shoes to the floor. And I even if I wanted to try, I just, I cannot dance. All right. But Mercutio doesn't stop. He's like, no, you are a lover. Borrow Cupid's wings and soar with them above a common bound. So take the wings of Cupid. If you are a lover, he'll let you borrow his wings that you can soar above the ground. You can get over this. You can get off the ground. You can fly higher than men can jump. But Romeo, upon the mention of the word Cupid, takes that idea and throws it back at Mercutio. Romeo's depressed. He's not 
dumb, at least not dumb in his ability to argue. And the choices that he makes, I'm going to argue he's stupid as can be. But in the language he can use, he's actually really effective at grabbing hold of someone else's words and firing them back at them in order to prove his own point, making a counter argument for those of you who've, who've looked at the videos on persuasive speaking. So he takes Mercutio's idea of Cupid and fires it back at him, saying, I am too sore and pierced with his shaft to soar with his light feathers, and so bound I cannot bound above the pitch of dull above dull woe under love's heavy burden do i sink so he's like you don't understand i can't borrow cupid's wings because cupid shot me with his arrow and made me fall in love and then didn't shoot rosaline which is why i'm depressed so the fact that i have this arrow inside of me is the reason why i can't dance i can't fly or jump or or do anything other than feel sad and it's love that's making me sad. So stop talking about Cupid, Mercutio. Now, Mercutio is a great talker, so he doesn't let Romeo win this point. Instead, he says, and to sink in it, should you burden love, too great an oppression for a tender thing. Like, oh, that's so sad. Something as soft as love has managed to make you sad. How weak you must be. But Romeo's response is to take him literally at that and say, like, is love a tender thing? It's too rough, too rude, too boisterous, and it pricks like a thorn. So Romeo's response is like, you're getting on me for love beating me up. Well, let me tell you about love. Love hurts. Love has kicked my butt, and I don't want to mess with it anymore. I'm done with that fight. To which Mercutio comes back with one of the all-time great lines, and, and once again, it's something that we've heard Benvolio say before. It's, it's advice that's not uncommon to a friend who is struggling with getting over uh, unrequited love and unreturned love. Mercutio says to him, if love be rough with you, be rough with love. Prick love for a pricking and you beat love down. Give me a case to put my visage in, a visor for a visor. What care I, what curious eye quote, doth quoth deformities? Here the beetle brows shall blush for me. Now, there's a lot of different ways you can read what's being said by Mercutio here, but the first two lines are really, really straightforward. If love has been rough with you, then you need to be rough with love. And you can take that in a couple of different ways. You can take that with its its obvious meaning saying that like, look, love has given you a bad time, then you need to give love a bad time. But that's not particularly incisive. What, what does it mean to be rough with love? Is this the same argument that Benvolio was making earlier where he's saying, look, if you've got a broken heart, you need to go out and break somebody else's heart, right? You can make yourself feel better by making someone else feel worse. And Mercutio is globalizing it beyond individual contact. Contact, because like the way Mercutio is talking about it here is different from what Benvolio says, because Mercutio is globalizing it. Mercutio is saying, offend love, and love being an emotion, not a person. It's okay to be rougher with that. If you take the way Benvolio meant it, with like someone has hurt you, you need to go out and hurt someone else. That's horrible advice. If you are upset and you go out and make someone else upset, that shouldn't make you feel better unless you're a sociopath. So there's, there's that particular line. The next line, prick love for a pricking and you beat love down. Now there's a double entendre here with, with the meaning of the word prick. Now, if you prick your finger with a needle, like I have to do several times a day to test my diabetes sugar, it's a small, sharp pain that's over with quickly. That's one meaning up. On the other hand, there's the, the double entendre of prick, which is a euphemism for male genitalia. Um, prick love for a pricking and you beat love down. Um, use that male genitalia for what male genitalia was designed for and you conquer love. That's another way to interpret what he's saying beyond just what Mercutio or what Benvolio had told him earlier. 
And then he turns away, and these next sets of lines can be very interesting in terms of how you go about reading the character of Mercutio. Because it's a masquerade ball, he starts trying on different masks. Give me a case to put my visage in. He's saying, give me a mask to cover up my face. A visor, which is a covering of the face on a helmet, for a visor, for a mask he's already wearing. What care I, what curious eye doth quote deformities? So why do I care what people see on my external face? And this is an interesting line. In the 1996 version of Romeo and Juliet, it's played that Mercutio actually has affection in a romantic way for Romeo. But Romeo does not return that affection. So you have this sort of love triangle potentially, if you read it this way, happening here where here he is encouraging Romeo to go out to dance to get over his sadness when really he's the one who wants to be with Romeo. And so he has to put on a mask to cover up his, his mask that he has to wear all the time for his affection for Romeo. And the beautiful thing this sets up is what happens later on at the party when Romeo sees Juliet and when Juliet sees Romeo. Up to that point, everyone has been pretending, everyone has been fake, everyone has had this false face. But when Romeo sees Juliet and Juliet sees Romeo, their masks come off and they see each other for who they truly are. So it sets up that as well. Now, Benvolio gets back to the nitty-gritty of their plan and says, Come, knock and enter, and no sooner in, but every man betake him to his legs. So he's saying, the second we show up, we get inside, we just hit the floor and start dancing. All right? But Romeo is being steadfast in his refusal to dance. A torch for me. Let wantons light of heart tickle the senseless rushes with their heels, for I am proverbed with a grand sire phrase. I'll be a candle holder and look on. The game was never so fair, and I am done. So, double entendres going on in here. No, I'll just hold this torch. You guys who have light hearts and light heels, you can go out and, and dance on the floor and tickle it with your heels. Like, that's all good and well. I just want to be a candle holder and look on. The game was ne'er so fair and I am done. Now there's a double entendre with game. Game, the game you play. So the game was never so fair. This is an unfair game of love since I'm already depressed. I'm done with it. Or game in terms of the way Mercutio and Benvolio are encouraging him to pursue women, which is the 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 hunting game the the animals that i would pursue are not fair are not beautiful to me so therefore i am done i don't want any part of this he's saying now when he says done mercutio comes back with a different pun and you need to understand the meaning of the word done not d-o-n-e but d-u-n d-u-n just means the color brown the the proverbial mouse in in this sense the the little brown field mouse was called a dun mouse back in the day and that's what mercutio was talking about here tut duns the mouse the constable's own word if thou art done will draw thee from the mire of this self sir of this sir reverence love wherein thou stickest up to thy ears come we burn daylight oh so he's saying, if you're brown, then you're a mouse, you're being too quiet. Or if you're brown because you're stuck in the mud, you're being a stick in the mud, let us pull you out. Let's get you out of your depression. Let's get out and dance. But we're burning daylight. We're wasting time. To which Romeo looks around at the darkness and says, it's not so. And Mercutio has to explain, no, dude, it's a figure of speech. I don't mean we're literally burning daylight. I mean, we're wasting time. So. Mercutio says, I mean, sir, in delay, we waste our lights in vain like lamps by day. Take our good meaning, for our judgment sits five times in that ere once our five wits. So your five wits are your five senses, you know, touch, smell, taste, hearing, sight, all right? Our, our five wits, our, our ability to think will be greater than our senses if we just get moving. Let's not waste our time with this. Let's get to the party. 
To which Romeo actually now starts to come around to his real objection for attending this party. He says, and we mean well in going to this mask, but tis not wit to go. And when he says wits, he's not talking about the five senses. He's talking about it's not smart. To which Mercutio is like, oh, why may one ask? And Romeo's response is, I dreamed a dream tonight. So Romeo is trying to explain to his friends, like, look, guys, before we came out, I had a little nap. And during that nap, I had a dream. And that dream told me that this is a bad idea. So Romeo seems to have had some sort of premonition. On the other hand, Mercutio's response to this idea that Romeo has had a dream is to say, so did I. I also had a dream tonight. Now, Romeo, out of curiosity, is like, well, what was yours? But Mercutio, in order to, to take away the power of Romeo's argument, says that dreamers often lie. So, do you guys believe that you can dream about the future and it'll come true? Maybe you've experienced something similar to that in your own life. But not everything you dream comes true. I mean, I had a dream earlier this year that Dr. Bennett and I were working in an office supply store earlier. Uh, it, it didn't actually happen. It's just a weird freaking dream that I had probably from eating pizza for dinner that night. Mercutio was saying, oh, you had a dream. I had a dream too. My dream told me that dreamers lie. So whatever you dreamed is a bunch of garbage. It doesn't matter. But Romeo, once again, showing his, his, his wit, throws back those words at Mercutio again. If dreamers lie, then in bed asleep where they dream things true. So he's talking about lie not to tell an untruth, but lie as in I lie down in bed. And when I lie in bed, I dream things that are true. And now we get the Queen Mab speech. I'm sorry if it's small on your screen. I blew it up as big as I could and to fit it all on this screen. What you need to understand here is a couple of things. One, there is Mercutio's purpose for giving this long, long speech. And it is to provide a counterpoint to Romeo. All right, Romeo says, I had a dream, and this dream tells me we shouldn't go. And so Mercutio has to present a counter argument against that idea. And this is his counter argument. We'll see how he weaves that particular web as he moves forward. But symbolically, this also works on another level because what Mercutio is talking about with this Queen Mab figure that he talks about in this speech is that Queen Mab was a fairy, uh, a mystical creature, not a nice fairy like Tinkerbell in the modern movies that my son likes to watch, but fairy in the ancient English sense of like trickster troublemaker. And Queen Mab is the one who messes with our dreams and who controls our actions when we wake up based on who we are. And it's this force that is beyond human control, this supernatural thing that controls our actions. There's a version of Romeo and Juliet called, um, wow, I can't believe I just spaced that. It's a musical, it's a song and dance in the 1950s, West Side Story. Don't know why it took me a minute to, to get that title in my brain, but it's Monday and I'm tired, so we're just going to roll with it. And in West Side Story, they don't give you the Queen Mab speech, but they have the equivalent of Romeo in that story lead a song and dance number called Officer Crumpkey. And for these kids who are in street gangs in the 1950s, the things that control their actions aren't fairies, aren't mystical creatures, but it's not themselves. They live in a world that they can't control with institutions, with grown-ups, with power figures that dictate their reality. And so that song, Officer Crumpkey, is all about how the characters in that play are also subject to forces that are, while not supernatural, are at least beyond the ability of a young person to understand or control. And once again, I think that's something that hasn't changed for young people in the last 500 years. But anyway, without further preamble, Mercutio begins the Queen Mab, Mab speech by saying, Oh, then I see Queen Mab hath been with you. She's the fairy's midwife, and she comes in a shape no bigger than an agate stone on the forefinger of an alderman. 
So he begins talking about the fairy Queen Mab, and here he means a literal fairy who is tiny, no bigger than the gemstone of a ring on a, on a city leader's finger. Drawn with a team of little atomies athwart men's noses while they are asleep. Her wagon spokes are made of long spider's legs that cover the wings of grasshoppers. The traces of the smallest spider's web, the collars of moonshine and watery beams, her whip of cricket's bone, the lash firm, and the wagoner a small gray-coated gnat. Now, before we get into anything else, now he's hammering home all these images, one, to talk about how tiny and how small Queen Mab is, but how outsized her effect on human beings can be. But there's also like deliberately chosen images here that tell you that Queen Mab ain't all good. All right, so her team is tiny little atoms, so small you can't see them, the, the horses that pull her chariot. But what makes up her chariot? What makes up her wagon? Well, the wheels are made of spider's legs. And I hate to tell you guys this, but those legs were not surgically removed. There's no seven-legged spider out there because he gave his leg up to Queen Mab. They ripped those legs off those spiders either after they were dead or before they died. Same thing with the wings of grasshoppers. She, she is a, a fairy whose locomotion is dependent upon death. Her ability to move is rooted in death, all right? The way she drives her horses, her whip is the bone of a cricket, the lash of film of, of spiderweb. Her wagoneer is a small gray-coated gnat, this tiny little bug, but this bug that once again feeds on human flesh. We're coming up on summertime, and if any of you guys go outside with a scrape or a cut on your arm, you'll notice if you're outside for any length of time, these little gnats love to keep trying to go after the places where your body is trying to heal itself because that's what they feed on. Not so big as a round little worm pricked from the finger of a lazy maid. Now this is an odd image. Once again, they're still talking about how small she is here, but now we're starting to get to some of the more sexual imagery here. Queen Mab only shows up in people's lives when they are asleep. What else do we think about when we're lying in bed? Well, sexual things. And so when they talk about her wagoneer is a small gray coated gnat, not so big as a little round worm, that little round worm has a phallic image. All right, what do worms look like? A certain region of the male genitalia pricked from the fingers of a lazy maid. And this maid in her handling of that worm has been lazy and as such it is soft and flaccid and flapping like a worm. All right, Mercutio for his own entertainment and as well for like keeping this interesting does not shy away from sexually explicit imagery as he continues in this speech. This also highlights another one of the like odd traditional beliefs of Shakespeare's time and earlier, where a maid, a virgin, a young girl, they believed that if she was lazy, if her hands became idle, they would grow worms inside of them that would have to be removed by pinpricks. So that's why young ladies always had to be kept busy at all times. They always had to have chores to do or be knitting or sewing or washing or doing something of a household duty because otherwise, well, idle hands are the devil's workshop. Okay. Her chariot is an empty hazelnut made by the joiner squirrel or old grub, time out of mind the fairy's coachmakers. And in this state she gallops night by night through lovers' brains, and then they dream of love or over courtiers' knees that dream on curtsies straight, or over lawyers' fingers who straight dream on fees, or over ladies' lips who straight on kisses dreams. Which oft the angry Mab with blisters plagues because their breaths with sweet meats tainted are. So Queen Mab, as she drives her chariot through the night, controls the dreams that people have. And you can have, once again, a double meaning for dreams. When I say 
when Romeo says, I dreamed a dream tonight, he's talking about, I was asleep and I saw pictures in my brain. But when Martin Luther King gave his, I have a dream speech, he wasn't talking about something he saw in his sleep. He was talking about his hopes or his aspirations. And Lady Mab controls, I'm sorry, Queen Mab controls both sets of these dreams. When she drives past lovers, they dream of love. But other people care about other things. Not everybody cares about love. A courtier is someone who exists in the court of the king or the queen. Someone who politics in order to gain power and prestige. And so what do they dream about? They dream about curtsying. They dream about bowing, about submitting themselves to power because that's what they love. Lawyers, it's a lawyer joke baked right into Shakespeare, all right? People have been making lawyer jokes for at least the last 500 years. And what happens when she drives over lawyers? Well, they dream about fees. They dream about cash that they get from representing people in court. And young ladies, when she drives over their lips, they dream about kisses. But that's not where it stops with these ladies. Because when the ladies are dreaming of kisses, Queen Mab leaves a blister behind. What's the blister that's on your lip? That's, that's herpes. They might not have had the term for it in Shakespeare's time, but they knew some ladies who went out and kissed different men sometimes got blisters on their lips. And Mercutio is saying that these blisters are actually left behind by Queen Mab in the night as punishment for these ladies because their breaths with sweet meats tainted are. Now, sweet meat could mean like a meat pie, a mince meat pie, or, or something like that, like a dessert, like they've been eating too much candy, and so she's punishing them for that. But once again, sweet meat also could be a euphemism for something sexual. And if these ladies have been using their mouths for sexual things, then sometimes herpes or other sexually transmitted diseases are part of that. At any rate, sometimes she gallops over a courtier's nose, and then he dreams of smelling out a suit. And sometimes she comes with the tithe pig's tail, tickling the parson's nose as he lies asleep, then dreams he of another benefice. So he goes back to take another shot at the people who kiss up to, to royalty, saying sometimes she drives over the courtier's nose and he dreams of smelling out a suit of a lawsuit that he thinks will bring him money and power. Or just like you guys have heard the term a brown noser. And what that means is like you've stuck your nose somewhere where you shouldn't stick your nose in order to kiss up to somebody. And that's left a brown stain on your nose. If you're smelling out a suit, it's gross, but Shakespeare's using that same idea here, all right? And then he takes a shot at one of his favorite targets, which is the church. You gotta understand, in, in Shakespeare's time, even though he lived in a Christian country, it was very much divided in terms of religion. After the Protestant Reformation, there was a split in Christianity where Catholics followed the teachings of the Pope and practiced the faith in their way. And then the Reformed Church started in England by Henry VIII also followed Christian teachings, but persecuted Catholics. And in England's history, depending on who was in power, the Catholics or the Protestants, one group would persecute the other group. And Shakespeare grew up with this in his own lifetime, where his father, who a lot of people believe was Catholic and practiced Catholicism, was eventually thrown out of public office. He was a sheriff in the town where Shakespeare grew up. He lost his job because of that. When he worked as a glove maker, he was continually fined by the state, and it's believed as punishment for his continuing to practice Catholicism. And so Shakespeare, seeing this religious debate bakes it into a lot of his plays, where even, uh, especially in Romeo and Juliet, he has a lot of unkind things to say and unkind treatments for holy figures or people who profess to be holy figures or representatives of the church. So when he talks about a parson or a preacher, when he sleeps, she tickles his nose with the tail of a tithe pig. Now, when I was being raised Catholic, we were taught that you were supposed to tithe. And what that meant was no matter what your income was as an adult, 
you owed it to the church to pay 10% of that before taxes. In order to thank God for the opportunity you've had to earn money. And if you didn't, it was a sin. So if I made $100,000 in a year, I had to donate, what, $10,000 to the church. And if I didn't, I was a sinner. And so what does this holy man dream about? Does he dream about God? Does he dream about Jesus or his faith? No, he dreams about tithes, about the money that his parishioners will pay him. And that tells you a lot about the way Shakespeare saw the church in his time. Sometimes she driveth over the soldier's neck, and then he dreams of cutting foreign throats, of breaches, ambuscados, Spanish blades, of heaths five fathom deep, and then anon drums in his ear, at which he wakes, and being thus affrighted, says a prayer or two and sleeps again. Now we turn, as the speech goes on, it goes from sexual to corruption to violence. And it's often played with Mercutio becoming increasingly agitated as he deals. Some play it as the unspoken affection that he has for Romeo. Some deal it with it as he says, just like with his own unhealthy perspective on love and relationships. As he gets deeper and deeper into the dreams that are given to people by Queen Mab, he turns to soldiers and they dream of the bloody things that soldiers do and see and hear. And they frighten themselves awake and then they pray and go back to sleep. So these horrible things that all people have inside of us are awakened and then with prayer they're, they're put back in their little box and that allows us to sleep again. This is that very Mab that plats the horse's manes in the nights, and bakes the elf locks in foul, sluttish hairs, which, once untangled, much misfortune bodes. Now, there's some odd, like, archaic belief going on in this one. So they used to believe in, in pre-Christian England and Ireland and Scotland that if you've ever woken up <laughs> with your hair all messed up and like knotted and matted and nasty, that that didn't just happen because you slept weird or you went to sleep with your hair wet or whatever. It happened because Queen Mab came along and messed up your hair while she was messing with your dreams. And if you went to the, the trouble of combing your hair and making it look nice, if you undid their work, then the fairies would come back and curse you with bad luck. And that's what he's talking about here. But once again, there's also other things that you can do while you're not asleep in bed that can lead to your hair being messed up. And that's, I think, why he chooses the word sluttish in terms of how he refers to the hair. Things that make your hair messy. Which, if you clean and if you straighten and if you fix, some people believed were bad luck. This is the hag, when the maids lie on their backs, that presses them and learns them first to bears, making them women of good carriage. This is she. And once again, since they didn't have a real understanding of biology or development of, of human beings, they used to believe that like, one of the things that happens with a young girl when she's a maid, when she's a virgin, as she starts to mature, is the her hips widen. Well, what causes that to happen? Well, in this version of events, it's because the fairy Queen Mab came and pressed down on her, spreading her hips wide and making her a woman who's ready to have children. Making them women of good carriage. This is she. At this point, Romeo is like, just hurt enough. He's like, dude, peace, peace, Mercutio, peace. Thou talkst of nothing. So Mercutio, peace, peace, calm down, son. You're not making any sense. And then Mercutio, after that long tangent, says, you're right. 
And that proves my point. Remember when I said dreams are meaningless because dreamers lie? Romeo, you said it yourself, thou talkst of nothing. True, I talk of dreams, which are the children of an idle brain, begot of nothing but vain fantasy, which is as thin of substance as the air, and more inconsistent than the wind. So he's like, you're right, Romeo, I am not talking about anything. I'm talking about dreams, and what are dreams? Nothing. Thank you for proving my point. More inconsistent than the wind who woos even now the frozen bosom of the earth and being angered puffs away from thence, turning his face to the dew dropping south. Once again, there's some sexual double entendre there, but we've had enough of that from Mercutio, so I'm just going to let that ride. Benvolio, who's had enough of both of these idiots at this point and who just wants to go party, says... The wind you talk of blows us from ourselves. Supper is done, and we shall come too late. Dudes, we already missed the food while y'all stand out here jabbering. Let's get to the party. And Romeo, despite his misgivings, despite his discomfort, despite his dream, says, I fear too early. So to go at all is to go too early for Romeo. For my mind misgives some consequence yet hanging in the stars. There's that idea, Romeo and Juliet being called star-crossed lovers. There's a, a fate hanging above Romeo written in the stars that he can't control. But this consequence yet hanging in the stars shall bitterly begin this fearful date. Whatever bad thing is coming my way starts tonight at this party. I just have a feeling that that's what this is going to be. And we in the audience who know how this ends with Romeo and Juliet both dead are like, uh-huh. But Romeo says, with this night's revels and expire the term of a despised life closed in my breast by some vile forfeit of untimely death. Whatever this bad thing is, I have a feeling it's going to kill me. It's going to end up with me dead. But he that hath the steerage of my course direct my sail. Aw, lusty gentleman. And you can read those last lines from Romeo a couple of different ways. Like one, he's putting his hand and his fate in God's hands and saying, he that directs my sail. If God wants me to die, I'll do whatever God wants me to do. Or he's handing over responsibility for his actions to his friends. You direct my sail, my friends. You want me to go party? All right, let's go party. And Benvolio, whose amp says, strike drum. And then they all march off to go crash the party. Okay, so we know the Montagues are on their way to come crash the party. And to give us an idea for how far along the party is, we now get a quick scene inside the Capulet house with the servants all doing their jobs. So the first servant begins, where is pot pan that he helps not take away? He shrift a trencher, he sh scrape a trencher. And all he's saying is like, where is the servant pot pan? Why isn't he helping us clear this table? He brought a plate, he should clean a plate. Like, why isn't this dude doing his job? And the second servant's reply is, when good manners shall lie all in two men's hands and they unwashed too, it is a foul thing. So if you're waiting for somebody who's a dirty servant to show good manners, you're going to wait for a long time. First servant says, away with the joint stools, remove the court cupboard, look to the plates. Good thou, save me a piece of march pane. And as thou lovest me, let the, tell the porter, let in Susan Grindstone and Nell. Anthony, pot pan. Now there's a couple of things going on here that, that are kind of entertaining. Why are the servants all like so focused on not just clearing the tables of the dishes and the food, but getting the stools and the tables out of the way? What are they trying to do? Well, based on the conversation we just heard, I think it's safe to assume they're getting ready to clear out some space so people can dance. And the other thing that they're planning is once the rich folks start dancing and they're not so important to keep bringing food and drink around, well, the servants are going to have a party for themselves. And the first servants is looking after his own interests. So save me a piece of March pain. It's essentially saying, like, save me a piece of the fancy cake. Make sure I get to have some of the good stuff, too. And speaking of some of the good stuff, tell the porter, the guy at the door, that when she shows up, let in Sue Grindstone and Nell. Now, grindstone, even that has certain sexual connotations, but yeah, make sure the ladies we like who are of our social class get into the party and we'll have ourselves a party too. Now, Anthony, pot pan. 
Aye, boy, ready. You looked for and called for, asked for and sought for in the great chamber. So people looking for you, go do your job. We cannot be here and there too. Cheerly boys, be brisk a while and the longer liver take all. So the first servant gets annoyed. The second servant is like, look, dude, you're asking too much. We can't be in two places at the same time, but don't worry about it. Life is long and simply by surviving we win so it's all right if we take a little bit extra time it's not going to kill anybody now with that setting the tone of like the fun and the fast moving words that are taking place the rest of the party goers now join on stage capulet juliet and other people in their masks getting ready for the party so capulet has a job to do as the host of these ceremonies. The, the meal is over, but the party's just getting started. So it's gonna be up to him to keep this party going. And so he gives a broad speech to try to encourage people to have some fun. Welcome gentlemen, ladies that have their toes unplagued with corns will have a bout with you. Aha, my mistresses, which of you will now deny to dance? She that makes dainty, I'll swear she'll have corns. And I'll come, come ah, die, screwed that part up, but I'm not stopping because I'm 35 seconds into this. All right, let me try it again. Ah, my mistresses, which of you all will now deny to dance? She that makes dainty, she, I'll swear, hath corns. Am I come near ye now? So, you guys ever been like, think back to a middle school dance where it's like all the girls are on one side and all the boys are on side and nobody really wants to actually dance even though everybody wants to dance? Capulet is gonna get this dance started by talking some trash to the ladies. He says, girls, if you don't have like corns, the big nasty thick sores on your feet that hurt when you walk, if you don't have those, get out and dance. And if you refuse to dance, I'ma tell everybody you've got nasty feet. Now who's gonna say they can't dance? Welcome gentlemen. I have seen the day that I have worn a visor and could tell a whispering tale in a fair lady's ear. Such as would please, tis gone, tis gone, tis gone. You're welcome, gentlemen. Come, musicians, play. A hall, a hall, give room and foot it, girls. So he has a different speech for the gentleman. Saying like, I remember when I was young enough that I could put on a mask and dance with a girl and maybe whisper a little something in her ear. I can't do that anymore. It's gone, it's gone, it's gone. I'm an old man now. Telling these young guys, you gotta get out there. You gotta make this happen because you don't have forever. Pretty soon you're gonna be too old, just like me. So let's dance, let's dance while we can. So musicians play, clear the floor and ladies, let's dance. So the musician plays, the dance begins, and then Capulet, who's also had a few drinks up to this point, starts hollering. More light, you knaves, and turn the tables up and quench the fire. The room has grown too hot. So he's, he's still barking directions. Let's get these lights up so you can see people, get these tables out the way, and put out that fire because it's hot. And if you guys have any experience with people who've been drinking alcohol, a lot of times they start to feel flushed. They start to feel uncomfortable. They start sweating, even though the room temperature hasn't changed. He's feeling a little bit warm right now. Now he's speaking to one of his cousins who he says, ah, sirrah, this unlooked for sport comes well. Nay, sit, sit, good cousin Capulet, for you and I are past our dancing days. How long is it now since last yourself and I were in a mask? So cousin Capulet, who's also apparently been drinking, is ready to go out and dance himself. And old man Capulet's gotta be like, hold on, man. You and I are too old to be out here dancing. Sit next to me and let's just talk. How long has it been since we were young enough to wear a mask and dance? But there's also this other thing where he says this unlooked for sport comes well. Now you could read that as he's talking about the ladies being unusually available and willing to give their time and their dancing. This unexpected, we'll say fun from the ladies is, is nice to see. Or he could be talking about certain uninvited guests that he's clocked as not being on his guest list, but he's still happy they're at the party because, you know, the more the merrier. 
And we all know who those guests that aren't invited are. So the second capulet says, by our lady, 30 years. So it's been 30 years since we were young enough to put on a, a mask and dance. What man? Tis not so much. Tis not so much. Tis since the nuptials of Luciento come Pentecost as quickly as it will, some five and twenty years. Then we were masked. So he's like, dude, it has not been thirty years since we were out here dancing with these ladies. We're younger than that. It's only been twenty-five years. But second capulet says, "Tis more, tis more. His son is elder, sir. His son is thirty. So you're clocking it by the dance at the wedding for Luciento. Well, Luciento's kid is thirty. So it's been at least 30 years since they got married. And Capulet can't believe it. Wilt thou tell me that? His son was but a ward two years ago. Like, dang, man. The kid grew up fast. And as Capulet is having his conversation, Romeo has had someone else catch his eye. Now, he thought he was coming here to see Rosaline, but someone else has attracted his attention. And so he grabs a servant walking by and says, What lady is that which doth enrich the hand of yonder knight? So he grabs the nearest guy and is like, Who is that girl? The servant says, I know not, sir, and leaves. And now Romeo has like a, a brief a brief soliloquy here where even though there are other characters on stage, he's sharing his innermost truth of thought with the audience. And he says, oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. So right away, the first thing Romeo says, and he starts to reflect on this girl that he sees is, dang, she is hot. Except the way he said it back in the day is she teaches the torches to burn bright. She seems to hang upon the cheek of the night like a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. Now, that's a really strange metaphor there, but what he's saying is if you guys have ever seen like a, a person who has dark skin wearing bright colors, the way those like neon bright colors just seem to pop against the darkness of their skin, that's the way this girl that he is watching shines like a jewel on a dark skinned person's ear, calling her a jewel and everything else around her darkness and night. Beauty too rich for use, for earth too dear. So she's so beautiful, she doesn't belong on this planet. So shows a snowy dove trooping with crows, echoing the words of Benvolio. I will think the make you think the swan that you see is more of a crow if you just compare her to other ladies. The truth of that is here. This new girl that he's looking at, now she's a snowy dove with a bunch of other crows all around her, ugly birds. As yonder lady over her fellows shows, the measure is done. I'll watch her place of stand and touching hers make blessed my rude hand. So this is where you start to see like Romeo, not just the poet, but Romeo the creeper start to manifest. His master plan is he's going to watch her until she's done dancing. And then he's going to walk over to her and hold her hand. <laughs> now... Maybe things have changed since I was a young man at the dances trying to build up my courage to talk to the girl I liked, but if I just walked up to a random girl I'd never talked to and grabbed her hand, I was probably going to get smacked or at least a dirty look. But Romeo thinks this is the appropriate way to pursue a woman. Now we get continued insight into Romeo where he says, Did my heart love till now? Forswear its sight, for I ne'er saw true beauty till this night. Rosaline who? <laughs> she was nothing. This girl. This is the girl I want. And like that, he has moved on. And this is something you need to ask yourself as you go about considering your opinion of the character Romeo. Is like, does he really love Juliet? Like one, she's apparently his rebound from Rosaline. Two, he falls in love with her with love at first sight, if you believe in that. But three, the second he sees her, he falls in love with her. And has his understanding of love changed really from what it was before? Maybe it's just she hasn't turned him down yet. But he thinks now, this is love. 
Unfortunately for Romeo, as he's been talking to himself, somebody else has been listening in. Tybalt overheard Romeo's little soliloquy there and recognized Romeo's voice. This, by his voice, should be a Montague. Fetch me my rapier, boy. What dares the slave come hither, covered with antic face, to fleer and scorn at our solemnity? Now by the stock and honor of my kin to strike him dead, I hold it not a sin. So Tybalt recognized Romeo's voice. He wastes no time. He sends his servant to bring him his sword, his rapier. And he's like, I don't care. I'm not thinking about the prince's threats. This guy comes to our party to disrespect my family. I'm going to kill him right now. Interestingly, Capulet, in his cups as he is, sees Tybalt, sees Tybalt getting angry and moves to block him. Why, how now, kinsman? Wherefore storm you so? Uncle, this is a Montague, our foe, a villain that has come hither in spite to scorn our solemnity this night. Young Romeo, is it? No. Did Tybalt say anything about it being Romeo to Capulet? Nah, Capulet had already clocked who that was. He knows it's Romeo. And has he acted against him yet? Nope. Capulet is actually keeping the peace. And let's be honest, has Romeo been acting a fool? Has Romeo been causing trouble? Up to this point, all Romeo has done is stood by the wall with a torch like he said he was going to do. So Capulet got no problem with Romeo being at his party. What he does have a problem with is Tybalt starting a fight at his party. Because remember, what's the punishment from the prince? You start a fight in these streets, I'll execute you. Not only will I execute the people involved with it, but I'll execute the heads of the household who start the ruckus. So if Capulet lets Tybalt start a fight here, not only will Tybalt be executed, but he can be executed too. So he's got a lot of reasons to squash this before it gets worse. Tis he, that villain Romeo. Content thee, gentle cause, let him alone. He bears him like a portly gentleman, and, to say truth, Verona brags of him to be a virtuous and well-governed youth. So let it go, man. Be cool. He hasn't caused any trouble. He's been a gentleman, and his reputation is good. I would not, for the wealth of all the town here in my house, do him disparagement. So we will not disagree. We will not disrespect him under my roof, not for any payment in the world. Therefore, be patient. Take no note of him. It is my will, thee which, if thou respect, show a fair presence and put off these frowns, an ill-beseeming semblance for a feast. So don't pay any attention to him. That's my order. And if you respect me and respect my place in this house, you'll stop frowning and you'll go out and have some fun at the party. So Capulet intercepts Tybalt and shuts him down. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't blow up at him. He just says like, hey kid, it's okay. It's a party, and he's not doing anything bad, and he's a nice enough kid by reputation, so whatever. But you, Tibble, you gotta, like, have some fun, too. It's, it's a party. Tibble is having none of that. It fits when such a villain is a guest. I'll not endure him. So, Remember the line from, from Capulet before, if you respect me, you'll let this go. Tybalt's not letting this go. Now, you could read this as Capulet's temper is a little bit loose because he's been drinking and he flares to anger pretty easily. But when Tybalt dares to contradict him, Capulet grabs him. And a lot of times it's staged with him becoming physical with the younger Tybalt. He shall be endured. What, Goodman boy, I say he shall go to. Am I the master here, or you go to? You'll not endure him. God shall mend my soul. You'll make a mutiny among my guests. You'll set cock a hoop. You'll be the man. So you're going to challenge my authority under my house? You're going to start a fight at my party? You'll not endure him? 
you'll set cock a hoop. Now that's a weird phrase, but like back in these days, a cock fight, a rooster fight where you take two roosters and a lot of times they're outfitted with like blades on their beaks and their claws. You put them in a ring together, they'll fight each other to the death. You're going to put a cock fight in my party and then there's the double entendre for the word cock and what that can mean. Now, Tybalt, who was not anticipating this from his uncle, says, Why, uncle, tis a shame. Go to, go to, you are a saucy boy. Is it so indeed? This trick may chance to scathe you. I know what. You must contrary me. Mary, tis time. Well said, my hearts. You are a print cox. Go. Be quiet or more light, more light for shame. I'll make you quiet. What? Cheerly, my hearts. Now, this sounds a little bit like bipolar here as he's jumping back and forth, but the party kind of grinds to a halt when Capulet starts yelling at Tybalt in front of all the guests. And so as he realizes this, he turns and like starts encouraging and cheering the party goers like, nothing to see here, guys. Keep on dancing. Let's get some more light. Let's have some more drinks. Let's do some more dancing. Come on. And then Toad goes right back to yelling at Tybalt. You are a print cox. That's once again the, uh, the flap of feathers on the top of a rooster's head. You are a peacock go-to. So he goes back and forth, jumping between yelling at Tybalt and encouraging the party to go on as it should. So, patience perforce with willful collar meetings makes my flesh tremble in their different greeting. I shall withdraw, but with this intrusion shall now seem sweet convert to bitter gall. So, patience perforce. Tybalt wants to kill Romeo, but he can't for fear of Capulet checking him. So he's forced to be patient, but his willful collar, his willful anger, is still so fresh that he is he is shaking he is so angry right now so he's leaving the party he will withdraw but eventually romeo's intrusion though it seems sweet now he plans to convert to bitter gall so i'm going to make romeo sorry he ever crashed this party so tybalt's not going to let this go he's leaving the party but he's going to find romeo and he's going to make him pay for this disrespect of crashing his family's party. And he leaves. And now we cut to Romeo and Juliet. The first time they actually address one another on stage. Romeo has acted on his impulse, gone up and grabbed her hand. But as he does it, he tries to spit a little game here. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle fine is this. My lips, two blushing pilgrims, ready stand to smooth that rough tush with a tender kiss. So, if my hands are dirty and sinful on the holy shrine of your hand, then you can find me, and my lips, two blushing pilgrims, will go to that holy sight and smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. And a lot of times this is played with him actually taking her hand in his and then kissing it as a way of making up for if he's being too forward with her. But there's also like important things to note as far as the language that's happening here. Now, one, if you take this entire conversation, it's 14 lines. It's a sonnet. It's a love poem. Juliet and Romeo, the first time they meet, their love is so perfect and so pure. It is a perfect love poem as they go back and forth right here. But it's not as simple as Romeo saying like, hey, baby, I love you. And her being like, oh, I love you, too. Juliet is in many ways in a much more dangerous situation than Romeo, even though he's the stranger in a strange land, the Montague in the house Capulet. Because a woman's reputation in this day and age was everything. And if word got round that you were easy or you were loose, then you would become in no short order untouchable in terms of marriage prospects. And so as such, if she like 
returns Romeo's overt affection here, it could be damaging to her reputation. And like I said, a woman's reputation is everything. I'll I'll put a link in the in the bio, a link in the description of another one of Shakespeare's plays from Much Ado About Nothing, where you can see like on her wedding day, a girl getting slut shamed in front of everyone by her fiance because her reputation got damaged. Like that's how serious this stuff was. And so if she's going to talk to Romeo, she can't be up front with her emotions. She's got to play hard to get. And so Romeo has already grabbed her hand and kissed her hand. Juliet's got to shut him down. She's got to give him the Heisman here. So she says, good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. So you guys have ever seen like people praying, they either fold their hands together or press their palms together with their fingers extended. It's often played that Juliet takes Romeo's hand deliberately from hers and gives it back to him and then shows him that he, if he wants to touch something, put your hand with your other hand and pray because that's the only like use your hands have around me. All right. Now she says it politely. You're disrespecting yourself too much. It's okay. If you want to be a holy pilgrim, you'd better pray. And the double meaning there being, if you think you've got a shot with me, you're going to need some help from Jesus. Now, Romeo, once again, showing his wit, takes Juliet's words and shoots them right back at her. She said that like pilgrims have hands that saints do touch. So he's like, well, if pilgrims and saints can touch hands, pilgrims and saints have lips. What about those? Have not saints lips and holy palmers too? Juliet, no slouch in terms of like her ability to, to throw words back at somebody, throws Romeo's back at him, says, I pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. Romeo, not to be dissuaded, says, Oh, then, dear saint, let lips do what hands do. They pray, gentle, grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. And now this is really telling as far as Romeo. He's, he's setting a trap for Juliet, and he's also telling the truth about himself in love. Remember, going back to Rosaline, how does Romeo see love? He sees love as sex. And when he was denied sex with Rosaline, he fell into despair. And despair is a word that gets thrown around a lot today that's become somewhat divorced from its original meaning. In Christianity, at least the way I was brought up, despair is the only sin that can't be forgiven. Despair, in, in that original Christian sense, is to abandon all hope, to give up the idea that things can get better. And the thing that makes it unforgivable, it's not that God can't forgive it because God is all powerful, all knowing and all good. God can do whatever in Christianity. But the thing is, is that if a sinner falls victim to despair, they won't ask for God's help. They won't believe that their prayers matter. And we've seen Romeo denied the lips and the hands of Rosaline fall into despair. And the trap he's planting here for Juliet is telling her, like, if you don't return my affections, you're sentencing me to the sinful state of despair. Now, Juliet has a comeback for that. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. So Juliet's response is, and... And I can remember being a little kid. I went to St. Barnabas Catholic Church. There's a big statue of St. Barnabas. And if you wanted to, you could go and like say your prayers to St. Barnabas and ask for his special help with certain things. And, and Juliet says, all right, well, if in this extended metaphor, I'm a saint, I'm not going to move as a statue does not move just because you pray to it. I might grant your wishes, that's neither here nor there, but I'm not going to move for you, physically. But Romeo sees that as an opportunity and says, Then move not while my prayer's effect I take, 
Thus, from my lips by yours, my sin is purged. And Juliet says she's not going to move. So Romeo's like, okay, great, don't move. Hold on. And then he leans in and kisses her. And says, thank you. Because with your holy kiss, you have now taken away all the sins from my lips. But Juliet, who's not exactly happy about being kissed by this random dude in the middle of a party, says, then have my lips the sins that they have took. So like, Romeo, you got your sins all over my lips. And Romeo, once again, instead of seeing a problem, sees an opportunity. Sin from thy lips? Oh, trespass, sweetly urge, give me my sin again. Like, oh, did I get my sin all over your lips? Hold right there, I'll get that back. And then he kisses her again. So in the span of like 30 seconds, you gotta like give it to Romeo for not moving slow. He's grabbed her hand, kissed her hand, and kissed her on the lips twice, despite the fact that she's not giving him any reason to think that she's into this at all. He's like borderline sexually harassing her, if you want to put it in the parlance of modern times. But Romeo sees something, he goes for it. Now, even at this, Juliet has a line that you can read it a couple of different ways. You kiss by the book. Now, the way I always interpreted this is like, okay, I maybe I've never kissed a girl and I don't really know what to do. So I go on Google and I type in how to kiss. And then I go to the website and it's like, step one, turn head to the side at 45 degree angle. Step two, close eyes. Step three, lean in. Step four, partially moisten lips and spread. Like if you like are doing it mechanically step by step, like you just read it off the Google page, is it going to be a good kiss? Is it going to be a passionate kiss? No, it's gonna be by the book, which is not particularly exciting probably for the person you're kissing. However, uh, it can be and has been played that some people are like, Ooh, you kiss by the book. Juliet thinks he's a good kisser. I think it's more fun if Juliet says he's not a good kisser, but you can read it either way. Now, at this point, the nurse shows up to block Romeo. Seeing this dude put his hands all over what is, for all intents and purposes, her daughter, the nurse is not exactly excited about this, because remember, Juliet's supposed to be spending time with Paris, not making out with some random dude. So the nurse comes running up and says, Madam, your mother craves a word with you. So maybe Lady Capulet has been watching this and is like, uh-uh, that ain't happening. He's, she's supposed to be kissing anybody. She's supposed to be kissing Paris. The nurse goes in to break up Romeo's smooch fest and send Juliet on her way. All right, Juliet typically wanders off at this point and Romeo asks, what is her mother? So who, who's her mom? <laughs> Which the nurse says, Mary Bachelor, her mother is the lady of the house and a good lady and a wise and virtuous. I nursed her daughter that you talked with all. I tell you, he that can lay out of her shall have the chinks. So the nurse spills the beans here. Her mother is the lady of the house. So she's a Capulet. And furthermore, that girl you were just kissing, I nursed since she was a little babe. So I don't know who you think you are, a little dude, but you better watch yourself. But then the nurse, because she can't resist it, also says, like, if you do happen to marry her, you're going to be rich. At which Romeo is shocked. The nurse wanders off and Romeo is just like, she is a Capulet? Oh, dear account, my life is in my, is my foe's debt. So Romeo's like, oh, crap. I just have been making out with my Hamley's enemy. I think I might have feelings for her. Oh, crap. And now Benvolio typically stumbles up and he's like, away, be gone. The sport is at best. And for those of you who, as you get older, end up going to parties, whenever you have a friend who who comes up and says, like, let's get out of here. This party sucks. It's usually because they've struck out with everybody they've tried to talk to. And now they're ready to get out of there because they don't want to make an idiot out of themselves anymore. But Romeo, who's still processing the fact that he's been kissing with his blood enemy, is just like, I so I fear the more is my unrest. He's like, yeah, let's get out of here, dude. I'm a little freaked out, too. But as they start to walk out, Capulet grabs them. He's like, nay, gentlemen, prepare not to be gone. We have a trifling foolish banquet towards. 
So Capulet doesn't want to let him leave. He's like, dudes, where are you going? The party's still going. Oh, we got some food. We're going to have some fun. Come on, stick around. But then, again, he has like somebody come up and whisper something in his ear. And his tone changes. Tis it even so. Why, thank you, then. I thank you, honest gentlemen. Good night. More torches here. Come on, then. Let's to bed. I, sirrah, by my fay, it waxes late. All to my rest. So what do you think got whispered in his ear that changed his tone so abruptly? Why did he go from being like, guys, where you going? We're going to party some more. We got some more food. To being like, whoa, wait a minute. It is late. Uh, Y'all got to go. Now, we know it's not that he just figured out these were Montagues, because he was cool with Romeo being a Montague at his party. I think somebody just whispered in his ears like, hey, uh, buddy, that dude was just making out with your daughter. <laughs> he was like, uh, okay, you can come to my party, but I draw the line at you kissing my daughter. Y'all got to go. In fact, everybody, everybody's got to go. Party's over. Turn on the lights. Get out of my house. And so they start making their way towards the door, and Juliet and the nurse are kind of left behind, and Juliet calls the nurse over. Come hither, nurse. What is yond, gentlemen? And, and Juliet's actually being crafty here, and you can even see like a little bit of mistrust for the nurse, because she doesn't point straight at Romeo and be like, who's that? She goes through a couple of different people trying to camouflage her interest. So that is the son and heir of old Tiberio. And what's he that's now going out the door? Marry that, I think, be young Petruchio. And what's he that follows there that would not dance? I know not. Go ask his name. And the nurse usually leaves at this point. And Juliet says to herself, and if he be married, my grave is like to be my wedding bed. Now, this is probably just teenage hyperbole, her saying, like, and if he's already married, I'll just kill myself. Like, I don't think Juliet's at that point. I don't think she's borderline suicidal at this point in the play. But it's a little ring-a-ding-ding for everybody in the audience being like, hey, guys, remember how this ends? Yeah, Juliet's more right than she knows, even though Romeo's not married. So the nurse comes back. His name is Romeo and a Montague. The only son of your great enemy. And Juliet, just like Romeo, is shocked. My only love sprung from my only hate? Too early seen unknown and known too late. So Juliet is shocked that she is just apparently, even though she wasn't giving Romeo any signs of the fact that she likes him, feeling something for Romeo too. But now she finds out that the feelings she has or for somebody she's supposed to hate. And now what does she do with those feelings? She can't go back and be like, oh, well, I never liked him anyway, because you can't like stuff that back in the box once it gets out. So now she's like, well, crap. <laughs> I wish I had known. I wouldn't have let myself feel this affection for him if I had. Prodigious birth of love it is to me that I must love my loathed enemy. So this is crazy. I'm in love with the person I'm supposed to hate. And the nurse, when she hears that, she's like, what is this? What's this? And Juliet's got like uh, 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 a rhyme that I learned even now of one I danced with all. So it's just, just the words to a song, just nothing, nothing important. Certainly didn't just fall in love with that guy that I'm supposed to hate because he's the sworn enemy of my family for generations untold. Then inside, someone starts yelling, Juliet! And the nurse says, anon, anon, come, let's away, the strangers are all gone. And with that, we end Act 1. We've seen the major conflict come up with the two families, and specifically the conflict for Romeo, which is going to be Tybalt, is gunning for him now. Tybalt wants to shut him down. Additionally, we've seen Romeo's got a little bit of problem, and that the person he's in love with is a Capulet, and that's not going to be easy for him. Same thing for Juliet. Even though she wasn't showing that she liked Romeo at first, because as a woman of good standing, she can't show that she likes Romeo. She likes him. She's into him. And now she's got to figure out what to do. So that's the end of Act 1, Scene 1. I'm sorry it took me so long to get these recorded. Three hours altogether. Dear golly, that's a lot of talking, and I'm sorry. But to do it right and to do it thorough, this is the way we got to do it. I'll start working on Act 2 today if 
time and children allows and we'll just keep it going we're coming up on the end game here as far as like getting stuff turned in and, and fixing past grades but it's still not too late all you guys have to do is watch a video and take some quizzes and you'll be okay um, I'll leave it at that. So as always, email me if you have any questions, problems, or comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell, and I'll see you when I see you.